Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Ambassador Kaoru Ishikawa from Japan on the challenges and opportunities facing Japan. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. I'm David Welch, the Balsley School's、uh, CG Chair of Global Security, as well as Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. And every week I'm pleased to welcome a guest here to the studios of the Center for International Governance Innovation. To speak about some important issue of global governance or world politics. And today I'm very pleased to welcome the Ambassador of Japan to Canada, Mr. Kaoru Ishikawa. Welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation. Hello, Professor Welch. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. So I'm pleased to have this opportunity to chat with you because you've had a long and distinguished、uh, international career and、uh, have a great deal of experience firsthand with global governance. Uh, I would like to get to that at some point, but first, if it's all right with you, I wouldn't mind asking you if you could give us a little bit of an update on things in Japan and how Japan has been doing、um, socially, economically, in terms of national morale since the devastating earthquake and tsunami of uh, March uh, 2011. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Professor, for giving me this、uh, wonderful occasion to talk about my country.、Uh, yes,、uh, you're right, more than seven months.、Uh, Have passed since the tsunami attacked my country. As you may know, our earthquake we are accustomed to, tsunami less so, though we did have several numbers of large tsunami. But the tsunami of that size in our history, we need to go back to year 869, so more than 1,100 years ago.、Oh, since then, we had several, three, four large tsunamis. The last one goes back to 1960, caused by an、uh, earthquake in Chile. We call it Chilean earthquake, which was also devastating. But according to the survivors of those two, tsunami, two tsunamis,、uh, this tsunami of 311 had nothing to compare with the、uh, Chile tsunami disaster. Now, incidentally, that Chilean、uh, tsunami triggered this、uh, Pacific Rim early alert system of tsunami. Which was also、uh, very functional、uh, after this 311 attack.、Uh, before answering directly to your question, how Japan is doing, allow me to say thank you to our Canadian friends. Canada is a cold country, climate wise, <laughs> but it's a very warm country, heart wise. And I really want to say thank you to the, Can- to the country Canada and people living in Canada. Well, Uh, Canada Red Cross alone raised more than $48 million,、uh, and that amount does not include other many, many, many money that、um, NGOs here and there have raised and sent directly to Tokyo Japanese Red Cross. And of course, money is very important for the victims of tsunamis, especially since because we have many orphans and elderly persons left. you know, Or、vulnerable generations were hit very badly.、Uh, well, they survived, while the working generations unfortunately have perished.、Mm-hmm. Because, given the geographical、uh, situation in Japan, especially in the northern part of Japan, fair cliffs go down directly to the ocean. And the coastline is not a straight line, it has a sort of sawtooth shape. And each village, as it Is situated at the very end of each small bay. So, to absorb the volume of tsunami, the wave went, went up high. In some villages, we saw, we found a trace as high as more than 40, almost 50, 50 meters. It's remarkable. And it, of course, this is the part of the world that probably was best prepared for a tsunami. There had been extensive construction of tsunami barriers and so forth yes, all along.、Indeed. Some tsunami barriers had as high as 60 meters, which we count from the bottom of the port, and more than 10 meters、uh, beyond the sea level,、mm. and yet it was not a defense.、Oh. Well, what I was trying to say is that given that、uh, cliffs, mountainous, hilly conditions, schools are often built uphill, like retired persons' homes, so many of them survived. But working generations who are in the village perished.、Mm. And that left us with many orphans and many elderly persons. And that is the large challenge we are facing at this moment. 
Infrastructure-wise, I hope I don't sound mean in saying that, but after all, it is a question of money. Mm -hmm. So the bullet trains or came back to service almost immediately, only a week later or so. Uh, like, likewise, motorways and basic uh, transportation access uh, came back relatively quickly. Uh, but the largest challenge remains, as I said, with how to rebuild the community. That is fair idea at this mm -hmm. moment. Mm -hmm. And many people who lived in those communities, of course, were relocated uh, to Tokyo or to Niigata, various other places, while they attempted to search through the rubble. And yes, indeed. It, it'll take some time, I guess, for people to resettle. I understand that families are now beginning to come back, for example, to yes. Fukushima area. Yes. Many people are also living in those temporary housings uh, that the communities and the government very hurriedly built for them. And people are coming back, that is true. Yes. What's but your sense of the spirit of the people? When, when I was in Japan after the, the devastating earthquake and tsunami, I was actually impressed by how people were maintaining their daily life fairly well and mm -hmm. how there was actually quite a positive, supportive uh, spirit. The, a lot of the press coverage outside Japan was, was different. It was emphasizing the negativity and the, the difficulties. That was not my experience well, while I was in Japan. Well, Professor, thank you for witnessing that. Uh, well, after 3.11, well, on that very day, I was nine or ten times on TV show. I'm so grateful that Canadian media gave that occasion to report to our Canadian friends for what are actually happening, because I was in close contact with the Mayhem government. Now, um, in not all, but there were few questions of who might have been targeting a kind of sensations. So I answered uh, them, and that question came not from your countrymen, from your southern neighbors, to be honest. So I, I told them, panic and sensation do not help. You know, panic and sensation may be all right for front page of some press, but not for the people, not for the government, not for the community who are actually facing the crisis. So that is how we reacted. And anyway, we are not to that size of a tsunami, I must be honest, yes, but we are more or less accustomed to how to deal with the aftermath of natural disaster. The spread of communities there, and, uh, well, we must move forward anyway, with or without natural disaster. Mm -hmm. There was no panic at all. I saw no evidence of panic whatsoever. Uh, no, there was no panic. In well, fact, it was, I could imagine that if that scale of disaster had happened in virtually any other country in the world, there would have been a great deal of chaos and mayhem and a breakdown of social order. Mm, that I'm not quite sure, maybe. I mean, there are, I'm sure that there, were, there would be many other countries who are well organized uh, like ours. But, uh, uh, daily training, uh, annual training for all the pupils across the country. Uh, how to run, run and run mm -hmm. when there's a uh, national disaster. That kind of things might have been helpful. Well, we'll be back in a moment again with Ambassador Ishikawa to talk about Japan and its challenges and opportunities. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Uh, Ambassador, how are things now? How would you characterize the current state of Japanese mm. spirit? Well, uh, economic activities are back. The components factories, are, well, which did cause trouble not only to the Japanese car makers, for example, but also the American Big Three, mm -hmm. because the component, that is really a re reflection of the fact that the world is globalized, uh, that there's no quote-unquote nationality in any given private company, and they're all intertwined. But there, the basic spirit, which I might say about my own country and about this uh, globalized world, is the revival of solidarity in the community spirit. And if I may show some Please. of the photos for the viewers of your audience. Uh, this is when His Majesty in Pro Japan visited one of the uh, shelters. Well. Uh, his Majesty is talking with one of the victims of the tsunami, and uh, this is to encourage the, those people. But I might also uh, remind those who watch this uh, TV or so, 
that you know, Emperor came was on TV few days, just few days after tsunami, to encourage his people, but also to express his sincere gratitude to those who were working to help our country. And so, uh, especially Canada is a very warm country to support us. And so I reported that also to the right honourable. Uh, let uh, uh, Mr. David Johnson, uh, your mm -hmm. uh, governor general, general right. uh, that our gratitude really comes from the bottom to the top, from the top to the bottom. Now I mentioned the community spirit revival. This is how people are helping each other. Those are all volunteers that came from inside and outside Japan, trying to serve some warm food. Uh, to the to the victim, they are uh, queuing, lining up. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this is to show some of the case how your precious money is used through the Jap Japan Red Cross. This child is being helped with this Japan Red Cross volunteer. And there's one more thing: the spirit to fight back the challenge uh, that you might recall that Japanese. Uh, women's soccer team won the FIFA Women's World Cup in Germany this year. Uh, well, the, you might have watched the final match between uh, this Japanese team and American women's team, which is of course very strong. But you might have seen the last minute kick, uh, kick, uh, kick in the, to the goal, to the American goals. And this could have happened only this year, I'm sure. The morale was very high. Mm. Those girls said that if we have to win, this is, it must be this year. So this kind of fighting back spirit, not against any other mankind, but against the challenge that we are facing, that is one thing which might be uniting us at this moment. Uh, just to reassure our friends across the camera, this is what it looked like. Uh, and one month later, the, the port came back and so on. And I can also say that about the road and the street. This, the, we, we take this photo in the same place mm -hmm. intentionally. And you might have seen the planes washed away in Sendai Airport. This was how it, it looked like two days after tsunami's attack. And uh, one month later, for the first commercial flight landed. Actually, the rescue plane did land before, before those commercial flights. Well, I'm saying this not to say that, hey, hey, we are doing well. It's not the, my intention to speak in, in that tone. But what I'm saying that uh, we really need to come back to a new normal. I like this expression. I, I borrowed this expression from one Canadian TV show. This, the anchor used that word, new normal. I like it very much because it can't be go back to normal. Mm -hmm after such a devastating tsunami which hit more than 1,000 kilometers coastal line, uh, killing more than 20,000 people and so on. How would you characterize this new normal in terms of Japan's international and regional relationships? There was very clearly a, a bump in sympathy, and uh, uh, many countries offered uh, help of various kinds, uh, for which Japan was very grateful. In fact, probably there were more offers of help than the infrastructure of the region could have absorbed at that time. Uh, but do you think that is a signal of a general improvement in regional and international relations? And do you think that will somehow have an effect on Japan's international role in the long term? Actually, I mentioned about the spirit of community, spirit of solidarity inside Japan and for Japan, uh, I mean for the Japanese victims. But I would rather say that if we can be optimistic that globally the spirit of community, spirit of solidarity might come back. Or, you know, as far as, allow me to start from our African friends. Japan had been carrying the process called TCAD, Tokyo International Conference on African Development, uh, 20 years ago. And it so happened that I was involved in the launching of the spirit of uh, spirit and process for TCAD. The slogan of TCAD was, and still is, no more charity, but solidarity. 
a horizontal eye line, eye to eye relations with our African friends. Now, what happened after the 311 tsunami? Even a quote, tiny unquote, I use that word in the GDP term, uh, in the neutral term, they donated us. Can't believe it. Maybe the amount might, be, might have been small compared to what your Canadians kindly gave us. But what really moved us was the heart behind each dollar, the heart behind each cent. I can say that also about Canadian children who baked cookies, who holded paper birds. You know that right. uh, we in Japan, when we pray for somebody, we made, we made 1,000 paper the Origami birds, cranes. Origami cranes. And I really didn't know, oh, well, I must say that unfortunately, Canada and geese, they don't come to Japan. But those origami cranes afforded by Canadian children, oh, I really don't know how many tens of thousands flew across over uh, Pacific Ocean. So I would say that that kind of reminder of global, global in the, in the sense of Earth, global solidarity, global compassion, we are sure that we can reactivate a little bit uh, that spirit in the, cost, in, in, in the process of this globalized quote-unquote world. Well, very good. Well, we'll be back to speak with Ambassador Ishikawa further in just a moment. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. Ambassador, uh, these kinds of devastating events are both a crisis and an opportunity. They do, in a sense, open up new realms of the possible, the reconstruction effort, the mm -hmm. idea to rethink how a country deals with its affairs internationally, domestically. Uh, one of the things we might want to rethink is what the experience of 311 tells us about global governance and how we might uh, reimagine the global no governance for issues that uh, really were, were brought to the fore by this uh, horrific event, the interconnectedness of global economies, um, the challenges and difficulties of responding to humanitarian disaster, uh, the energy situation, of course, one of the most interesting uh, long-term effects of this disaster was uh, its effect on global attitudes towards nuclear power, for example, and uh, pointed up some of the difficulties of tightly integrated energy systems. Uh, you have a lot of experience yourself in global governance as a longtime Sherpa for Japan at the G8 meetings. Uh, even before the G8, you were telling me before we went on camera, you had experience in the G6. Uh, how would you like to see a global governance refashioned to try to improve responses to these various kinds of challenges. The disaster wasn't just a j disaster for Japan. It had rippling effects across the world. Well, Professor, thank you for the question. Of course, that is not an easy question to answer because uh, people tend to f forget, maybe, uh, especially in North America and Europe, uh, because wall which divided Berlin fell 20 years ago already. And understandably, young children all over the world, including my own, in my own country, they can't imagine that they were shooting from f those young boys or young girls who tried to ex escape from East Berlin to West Berlin, and all this tragedy happened. But most unfortunately, in in our world, democracy is not only still not yet prevailing. There are some countries who still believe that totalitarian regime is better than democracy. Well, we would say it's for a great surprise, to a great surprise, but it is a fact that we are facing. In Asia, we are facing that. In some other uh, continent, uh, we are still facing that. We must take that reality very seriously. And we need to show that democracy is better than any other regime. Now, uh, under our own constitution, for example, we can't send abroad fighting, combating team. So in the context of PKO, for example, we usually send civil engineering troops, uh, rebuilding the water distribution network, building hurriedly shelters for those uh, people who are suffering and so on. Now, uh, 
That leads me to say maybe the following. Democracy, what it is after all, it is participation. Well, incidentally, uh, market, market economy is also participation. How to make people participate? After all, that is a clue to answer your question, a very difficult, uh, very difficult question. What is global governance? How can we improve global governance? Uh, there are people who say that regional governance is actually more important than global governance for certain kinds of issues, and that if East Asia had an appropriate regional security and economic governance mm -hmm. apparatus, you know, responses mm -hmm. to the disaster would have mm -hmm. been more effective. Mm -hmm. um, my view is that East Asia is actually remarkably rich in terms of governance. Mm, yes. There's many, many different yes. organizations, yes. Uh, sometimes even jockeying for influence over issues in the mm, region. Yes. Uh, is that a, an opportunity, the, the richness of East Asian international institutions and fora, or is that a, a challenge to be managed? Does it need to be streamlined and simplified in some way? Oh, no. I think diversity is a source of any energy. Well, in East Asia, we have been cooperating, supporting the wonderful efforts carried by ASEAN since the, the creation. Uh, and around ASEAN, there are many uh, governance institutions, like ASEAN Plus 3. Uh, we can also talk about this on the security side about ARF, Asian Regional, Regional Forum. Uh, uh, there's also NAOPAP talking about North Pacific security and so on. Well, uh, I'm not uh, that worried about uh, the governance, original governance in East Asia. It's, it's working quite well because so those uh, regional uh, governance or institutions, we can very quietly, without trying to intervene to any other country's domestic politics, we can very quietly but effectively and efficiently show that democracy is better than any other system. And that is what uh, we believe. Or, you know, but there is, of course, one big challenge, that is United Nations. We absolutely need to reform United Nations. Why is that? Because, well, before coming here to Canada, uh, about a year and two months ago, I was ambassador of Japan in Egypt for almost three and a half years. And I always teased my Egyptian friends that since you invented what we now call culture and civilization, there's a problem. So my Egyptian friends always ask me, what? What do you want to say? So I said, since the civilization was born, history and justice have always been written by the winners of the then most recent war. Might is right. I think that time has come to change a little bit that, that wisdom should be more important than might. Mm -hmm. Wisdom should be more absolutely more important than bloodshed. And understandably, the actual, understandably, here I, I must stress this because otherwise it would lead to any possible misunderstanding of what I'm going to say. Understandably, United Nations management are under the hand of the so-called winners of the Second World War. But how many countries were there in those days? 50, 60? And we have, what, 193? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure that time has come to say that wisdom should prevail to decide about the management of the United Nations, who would be the permanent uh, member of the uh, Security Council and so on. There are many details on that, which I won't into go into detail uh, given the shortest time here. But this allow me to reiterate again and again, time has come to stop that bloodshed decide justice. Mm -hmm. Time has come that wisdom, and that is what we are given from I'm not speaking for any religion, but right. we are supposed to be wise. We 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 mankind. Uh, that is what I would like to say. But hastily, I want to add one more thing. I I spoke about wisdom of mankind. Yes, but this year was a reminder that we must be humble, especially for my country. You asked me questions about 3:11, and my true answer about what. I think about 3.11 that, yes, 
time has come to v that we respect again the great mother nature. Respect again, what do I mean? That means that time has got to find again a good point of balance between great mother nature and mankind and great mother nature and science and technology. The great challenge for the 21st century. We'll be back with the ambassador in one minute. Uh, you're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back, Ambassador, in our remaining few minutes. If you don't mind, I wouldn't mind asking you about U.S., uh, sorry, Japanese-Canadian relations. Yes. Uh, a couple of years ago, during the uh, celebrations of uh, 80 years of Canadian-Japanese bilateral yes, official indeed. relations, we had a uh, conference in Toronto mm -hmm. that I helped organize, and the, uh, the, there was a great deal of energy in the room, and the consistent theme of all the presentations was the... Canadian-Japanese relationship has a great deal of potential, but there's a great deal of room left to exploit the potential. Uh, I wonder if you share the view that uh, this is a relationship that hasn't quite yet uh, reached the maximum capacity for mutual benefit that all of the participants back at that seminar seem to think. What, is that your view? And if so, what might we do to try to improve uh, the, the, uh, our mutual ability to exploit each other's uh, benefits? Well, I must say that I share your view, and thank you for asking that very important question. Uh, I must start from the big thing, and I, 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 I will maybe continue to go to the, some pragmatic things. A few moments ago, I mentioned about the, a point of balance to be reestablished between great mother nature and science and technology. But yet, and because of that, we should have full confidence in science and technology, while not forgetting to say thank you to the great mother nature. And there, Canada and Japan, we can do a lot. Future-oriented science and technology cooperation is what we have in mind. This year, it so happens that uh, we are celebrating 25th anniversary of Japan-Canada science and technology cooperation. And there have been many events through the year, but one highlight that I want to stress is this photo. This is the world-renowned Canada. And this is a cargo ship. This is the only cargo ship now, after our American friends stopped the Space Shuttle project, which can carry huge tonnage of cargoes to revitalize those. This is the International Satellite uh, Station, FAIR, researchers, astronauts from Canada, Japan, America, and Europe, and Russia are cooperating together. Incidentally, this is uh, the Japanese experimental tower, 20 meters long, and so on. But what I want to say is here, this cargo ship uh, we launched with a rocket. The rocket's name is uh, H2B, twice already to revitalize this satellite station. and. This was the first unmanned docking that we did, I mean, any, any country did. Uh, of course, I'm happy and proud of that, but what I want to stress is not that, hey, hey, Japan did that. No, what I want to stress is that that docking, of course, could, make, could happen because of or thanks to the cooperation between Canada and Japanese rockets. This is a very future-oriented uh, concrete case of cooperation that Canada and Japan are carrying together. Now, I'm happy to say that uh, we have a framework of agreement to cooperate for stem cell research. You know that, uh, forgive me to speak about some other university, but Toronto University, together with Japanese Kyoto University, we are at the very front line of IPS stem cell research. Mm -hmm. Recently, Professor, very renowned Professor Yamanaka uh, was among the 40 Japanese Canadian researchers who gathered for the seminar. We are about to launch a nanotechnology uh, joint cooperation. And nanotechnology, of course, uh, well, it's thanks to the development of nanotechnology that we can use, for example, the cell phone. Uh, those who belong to my generation, the telephone was that big before. Yeah. And so on, so on. So what I would say that, yes, we must target the future. And in doing so, also we should not forget about the reality. 
this, well, I see that this, this is, I know that this is too small for the camera, but so I don't, I didn't mean to show each of the item, but I just want to, 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 to hang this here to illustrate that we are already very interdependent, economically speaking. Uh, the graph that I've just shown was uh, how we depend on Canadian food product to feed ourselves. You know, Japan imports more than 60, 60 percent of food that man and animal eats. Mm -hmm. And allow me, for example, uh, one fifth of uh, wheat that we need to bake a bread or make a noodle comes from Canada. T you, you know tempura, the right. fried, fried fish, fried rice. We use canola oil. Canadian share of market is 98 percent. And so, so uh, the list continues. Of course, I can. St uh, talk in length about energy resources and so on, and mutual uh, trade on high-tech things. Uh, there's a, quite a number of Japanese car factories in Ontario, as you know. Uh, but your national pride bombardier plane, uh, not many persons know that the fuselage of, of uh, C-series of bombardier, uh, a large portion of that was made by Mitsubishi heavy industry with the carbon fiber, mm -hmm. or we import from a company named CAE f based in Ontario for the flight simulator. Right. So we have that kind of interdependency in high tech to food. But you are right, we, we have still a huge margin to deepen that cooperation. And that is why we are at the, at the very final stage of pre-negotiation uh, study for economic partnership agreement. I should touch it, but I sincerely hope that what your Prime Minister and my Prime Minister uh, agreed in principle, that to say we would target for that kind of uh, close economic ties would realize in a very near future. Well, let's hope that bears fruit. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for coming in and sharing your time and expertise with us. I appreciate it. I understand you're in demand and I uh, hope to be able to welcome you back to the University of Waterloo and the Center for International Governance Innovation at some point. And to our audience, thank you for watching. You can find us uh, anytime at cgonline.org, on Facebook and Twitter and on YouTube.